This video is about limits. We're going to focus on finding limits graphically, analytically, and even finding one-sided limits, limits at infinity. We're going to talk about continuity and a few other stuff as well. So let's begin. Let's say if we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left side. And let's call this function f of x. What's the answer? So first, we need to locate negative 3 on the x-axis, which is over here. Now, x is not exactly negative 3, but it simply approaches negative 3 from the left side. And we're looking for f of x, which is associated with the y variable. So as x approaches negative 3 from the left side, the y value is approximately 2. So that's the answer for this one. Now, what is the limit as x approaches negative 3, but from the right side? So what is the y value as x approaches negative 3 from the right? So if we follow the function, notice that the y value is about 3. Now, what is the limit as x approaches negative 3 from either side? Since the left side and the right side, these are known as one-sided limits, because they don't match, the limit as x approaches negative 3 from either side does not exist. Now, what is the value of f of negative 3? So when x is exactly negative 3, what is the y value? When x is negative 3, we have the closed circle. And the y value at that point is negative 3 as well. So f of negative 3 is negative 3. Whenever the limit doesn't exist, you have a discontinuity. Now, what kind of discontinuity do we have at negative 3? Is it a point discontinuity, a jump discontinuity? or an infinite discontinuity. This is known as a jump discontinuity. You can see the jump or the disconnect between the two graphs. Now, a jump discontinuity, is it removable or non-removable? A jump discontinuity is a non-removable discontinuity. Now, let's move on to the next one. What is the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left side. So negative 1 is at the vertical asymptote. So if we follow the curve from the left side, notice that it goes upward towards infinity. Now what about the limit as x approaches negative 1 but from the right side? So if we follow the function from the right side, it also goes up to infinity. Now what about the limit as x approaches negative 1 from either side? Because the left side and the right side are the same, it's going to be positive infinity. Now you have to be careful with this one because we have a vertical asymptote at negative 1, and so the graph exhibits unbounded behavior at this point. And some textbooks will say that the limit does not exist. And their rationale behind that is infinity is not really a number. The graph keeps going up. It doesn't converge to a specific number. And so that's why some textbooks may say the limit does not exist for this example. And others will simply write infinity. But just keep in mind, infinity is not a, it doesn't converge to a specific number. It just keeps on going up forever. Now what about f of negative 1? What's the answer? Now notice that there's no closed circle along the vertical asymptote. So there's no y value when x is negative 1. So this function doesn't exist, or this value doesn't exist at x equals negative 1. 
So what kind of discontinuity do we have at x equals negative 1? Since we have a vertical asymptote, this is an infinite or an infinity discontinuity. Infinity discontinuities are non-removable. Now what is the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side? So here's the value of 1 on the x-axis. As we approach it from the left side, the y value is 4. Now what is the limit as x approaches positive 1 but from the right side? So as we approach it from the right side, the y value is still 4. So what is the limit as x approaches 1 from either side. Because the left side and the right side are the same, the limit exists. It's equal to 4. Now what is f of 1? So when x is exactly 1, what is the value of y? So in this case, we need to look for the closed circle. And it has a y value of 1. So f of 1 is equal to 1. Now, because the limit does not equal the function at x equals 1, we have a discontinuity. Now, what type of discontinuity do we have? This is known as a point discontinuity, also a removable discontinuity. Now, what is the limit as x approaches 3 from the left side? What's the answer for this one? And also, try these as well. What is the limit as x approaches 3 from the right side? And as x approaches 3 from either side? And what is f of 3? So once again, we have a vertical asymptote. From the left side, notice that it goes up to infinity. But from the right side, it goes down to negative infinity. So therefore, because these two do not match, the limit does not exist. And f of 3 is undefined. In the last example, I put does not exist, but undefined is a better answer because let's say if f of x is equal to 1 over x where we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 if you plug in 0 this is said to be undefined so it's undefined at a vertical asymptote what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. And in addition, what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side? And as x approaches 2 from either side, and also find the value of f of 2. Now what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. So if we follow the curve from the left side as we approach 2, notice that the y value is 2. Now as x approaches 2 from the right side, the y value still converges to 2. So therefore, the limit as x approaches 2 from either side is 2 since the left side and the right side are the same. Now what is f of 2? So when x is exactly 2, what is the y value? So we need to look at the closed circle. And when x is 2, we can see that y is 2. Notice that all of the values agree with each other. So at x equals 2, it is continuous. The function is defined. The limit exists. And the limit equals the function. 
Now sometimes on a test, you may be asked to prove that a limit exists at a certain point, which is kind of what we did in the last example. So there's something called the three-step continuity test. The first thing you want to do is make sure the function is defined at a certain point or at the point of interest. In this case, at x equals a. Then the second thing is you want to make sure the limit exists at x equals a or as x approaches a. And then step three, you want to prove that the limit is equal to the function as x approaches a. So the first thing we could do to prove it, step one, we could say that f of 2 is equal to 2 in the last example that we did. So f of a is defined. Step two, we need to prove that the limit exists. So you need to check the left side and the right side limit. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the left for f of x, that was equal to 2. And the limit as x approaches 2 from the right is equal to 2. Because these two are equal to each other, the limit as x approaches 2 from either side exists. And it's equal to 2. Now the third step is to make the statement that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to f of 2 because they both share the same y value. And that's the process of what you want to follow whenever you want to prove that a certain point is continuous. So that's the three-step continuity test. So now let's work on some examples where we can evaluate a limit algebraically or analytically. What is the limit as x approaches 2 for the function 20 divided by 3x plus 4? So how can we evaluate this limit? Now the first thing you want to do, or that you want to check, is to see if you can substitute x with 2. And for this example, direct substitution works. As long as you don't get a 0 in the denominator of the fraction, you can plug in 2. So 3 times 2 plus 4. 3 times 2 is 6, and 6 plus 4 is 10. So we can cancel a 0. So 20 over 10 is the same as 2 over 1, which is 2. And so that's how you can evaluate the limit of a function. Let's try another example like that. Feel free to pause the video as you work through this example. So what is the limit as x approaches 1 for the function 3x squared plus 5x minus 8? Let's go ahead and substitute x with 1. one squared is one times three is three plus five minus eight three plus five is eight eight minus eight is zero so that's the answer for this particular problem now what about this one what is the limit as x approaches five for this function x minus five divided by x squared minus twenty five now what's going to happen if we try to use direct substitution? So if we plug in 5, it's going to be 5 minus 5 divided by 5 squared minus 25. Now 5 minus 5 is 0. 5 squared, that's 25. So 25 minus 25 is 0. 0 over 0 is indeterminate. You don't know if it's going to be 0, if it's going to be infinity, if it's going to be 8. We don't know what this is. So because we get a 0 on the bottom, we can't use direct substitution. We need to use another method. In a situation like this, what you want to do is you want to see if you can factor the expression. So how can we factor x squared minus 25? 
what we have is the difference of squares. If you have a squared minus b squared, it's a factor. It's going to be a plus b times a minus b. The square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 25 is 5. We're going to have a plus and a minus. So notice that we can cancel x minus 5. So once the x minus 5 in the bottom disappears, we can now evaluate the limit using direct substitution. So let's substitute x with 5. So it's 1 over 5 plus 5, and 5 plus 5 is 10, so it's 1 over 10. 1 over 10 as a decimal is 0.1. So this is the answer. Try this one. What is the limit as x approaches 4? For x squared minus 4x divided by x squared plus 3x minus 28. So should we factor or can we use direct substitution? Well, let's see if direct substitution is going to work. So let's plug in 4 into the bottom. So it's 4 squared plus 3 times 4 minus 28. 4 squared is 16. 3 times 4 is 12. 16 and 12 is 28. So we get a 0 in the denominator, which will not help us to get the answer. So we need to factor. So how can we factor x squared minus 4x? All we can do here is simply remove the GCF. We can take out an x. x squared divided by x is x. Negative 4x divided by x is negative 4. Now what about the bottom part? How can we factor a trinomial with a leading coefficient of 1? For this example, find two numbers that multiply to negative 28 but add to 3. So factors of 28 are 1 and negative 28, 2 and negative 14, 4 and negative 7, or negative 4 and 7. Negative 4 plus 7 is positive 3, and they multiply to negative 28. So to factor it, it's going to be x minus 4 times x plus 7. Notice that we can cancel an x minus 4. So what we have left over is the limit as x approaches 4. We have an x on top and x plus 7 on the bottom. So now we can use direct substitution. So it's 4 divided by 4 plus 7. 4 plus 7 is 11, so the final answer is 4 over 11. Consider this problem. What is the limit? as x approaches 0 for this function, 3 plus x squared minus 9 divided by x. So for this example, we can't use direct substitution. Otherwise, we will get a 0 in the denominator. Now, we can FOIL the 3 plus x squared, or we can factor it. But let's go ahead and FOIL 3 plus x squared. So this is the same as the limit as x approaches 0, 3 plus x times 3 plus x. So we need to FOIL. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times x is 3x x times 3 is also 3x, and x times x is x squared. And we can rewrite everything else. By the way, on a test, for every step, you need to rewrite the word limit until you substitute 0 into x. Some teachers will take off points if you don't rewrite the limit expression. Now, notice that we can cancel a 9. So what we now have is x squared. And we can combine 3x plus 3x, which is 6x. 
So now let's factor an x from the numerator. Let's take out the GCF. So if we factor out x, it's going to be x plus 6. x squared divided by x will give you this x. And 6x divided by x gives you the 6. So now we can cancel this x. So once this x disappears, you can now substitute 0 into x. So what we have left over is x plus 6 or 0 plus 6. And therefore, the final answer is 6. Now, if you ever get stuck in terms of what to do to simplify a limit before you can use direct substitution, you can always use your calculator to get the answer. This is very useful if you're, first of all, allowed to use a calculator on a test and if it's multiple choice. So let's pick a number that's very close to 0. So let's find out what f of 0.1 is equal to. So if you type this in, 3 plus 0.1 squared minus 9 divided by 0.1. It's going to be 3.1 squared minus 9. Take that result, which is 0.61 divided by 0.1, and it's 6.1. Now keep in mind, our answer was 6. Now notice what happens if we choose a value that's closer to 0. So let's use 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.1. So 3.01 squared minus 9, that's 0 0.0601, divided by 0 0.01. This is equal to 6.01. Notice that the answer is getting close to 6. And it's very close to it. So you can see that it's going to converge to 6, which means that the limit exists. Now if you try a negative value, let's say negative 0 0.001. So it's going to be 3 minus 0 0.001 squared minus 9 divided by negative 0 0.001. 3 minus 0 0.001 is 2.999 raised to the third power, or excuse me, raised to the second power, minus 9 divided by negative 0 0.001. You should get 5.999, which is approximately 6. So as long as you plug in a number that's a very very close to 0 but not exactly 0, you can get the answer. Direct substitution works. Try this one. What is the limit as x approaches negative 3 for the function x squared minus 9 divided by 2x squared plus 7x plus 3. So whenever you have like a rational function where you have a polynomial divided by a polynomial, your initial instinct is to factor. Factor and cancel. So on top we have the difference of perfect squares. So using the equation a squared minus b squared is a plus b a minus b to factor x squared minus 9 it's going to be x plus 3 times x minus 3. But whatever you do, don't forget to rewrite the limit expression. Otherwise, you may lose points on your tests. Now, how can we factor a trinomial where the leading coefficient is not 1? So how can we do that? Let's multiply 2 and 3. 2 times 3 is 6. And we need two numbers that multiply to 6 but add to 7, which is the middle term. And this is 1 and 6. 1 times 6 is 6, but 1 plus 6 is 7. So I'm going to factor this expression on the side, and then I'll put the answer um, back where it belongs. Now what you want to do is you want to replace the 7x with 6x plus 1x. So notice that the value of the expression remains the same. 6x plus 1x is 7x. So now at this point, you want to factor by grouping. So take out the GCF or the greatest common factor from the first two terms. The greatest common factor is 2x. 2x squared divided by 2x is x. 
and 6x divided by 2x, that's 3. Now for the last two terms, it doesn't appear as if there's a, a GCF to take out. And whenever you come across a situation like that, take out 1. If you factor out a 1, it's simply going to be x plus 3. Now, if these two factors are the same, then you're on the right track. You can factor out x plus 3. And the stuff that goes in the second parentheses is the stuff that's on, that's on the outside. That's the uh, 2x plus 1. And so we can put that here. So now we can see that we can cancel x plus 3. Once we do that, we can use direct substitution to get the answer. So the limit as x approaches negative 3 for the function x minus 3 over 2x plus 1 is going to be negative 3 minus 3 over 2 times negative 3 plus 1. Negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. And negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. Whenever you have two negative numbers divided by each other, it's going to be a positive result. So the answer is positive 6 over 5, which is 1.2 as a decimal. Here's another example you can try. What is the limit as x approaches 5 for the function x minus 5 over x cubed minus 125? So we can't plug in 5. 5 to the third is 125. 125 minus 125 is 0. Now what we need to do is we need to factor x cubed minus 125. But how can we do it? So what we have is a difference of perfect cubes. And the equation is a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. So a to the third is x cubed and 125 is b to the third. So to find a and b, we need to take the cube root of x cubed, which is x, and the cube root of 125, which is 5. And there's going to be a negative sign. a squared is x squared. ab is x times 5, which is simply 5x. And b squared is 5 times 5, which is 25. So we can write our expression as, well first let's make some space. So what we now have is the limit as x approaches positive 5 and on the bottom we have x minus 5 times x squared plus 5x plus 25. So we can cancel the x minus 5. And at this point, we can substitute x with 5. So it's going to be 1 divided by 5 squared plus 5 times 5 plus 25. 5 squared is 25. 5 times 5 is also 25 plus another 25, which is 25 times 3, which is 1 over 75. Now what is the limit? as x approaches 0 for this function. 2 plus x to the third power minus 8 divided by x. So notice that this expression is in the form of the difference of perfect cubes. So using this equation we can factor it. Or you could FOIL 2 plus x three times and get the answer this way, but I'm going to use the equation. So what we need to realize is that a is 2 plus x and b is 8. So a, if a to the third is 2 plus x to the third, a is 2 plus x. And if b to the third is 8, then b is the cube root of 8, which is 2. So we have 2 plus x minus 2 a squared, that's going to be 2 plus x squared. And then plus ab, so that's b is 2, and a is 2 plus x. Then plus b squared, 
which is 2 squared, so that's simply 4. So that's how we can factor it. But notice that the 2's cancel. So what we now have is the limit as x approaches 0. On top, we have an x left over multiplied by 2 plus x squared plus, I guess we could distribute this too. So it's going to be 4 plus 2x plus another 4 divided by x. Now we can cancel this x, which is good. So that means we can plug in 0 into the equation now. So now, what we have is 2 plus 0 squared, that's this part, plus 4 plus 2x, which is just 2 times 0, and then plus this other 4. So 2 plus 0 is simply 2, and 2 squared is 4, plus another 4 plus another 4, 4 plus 4 plus 4 is the same as 4 times 3, which is 12. Multiplication is simply repeated addition. And so the final answer is 12. Now let's confirm it using direct substitution. So pick a number that's very close to 0 that we can plug in. And let's see if it's going to give us 12. So let's find out what f of 0 0.01 is. So it's going to be 2 plus 0 0.01, which is 2.01, raised to the third, minus 8, over 0 0.01. 2.01 to the third power is about 8.120601, minus 8, which is 0 0.120601, divided by 0 0.01. And the answer you get is 12.0601. Now, just to be on the safe side, let's pick a smaller number. So let's try 0 0.001. You should at least do it twice with two different numbers. Because if it changes, then it doesn't converge. But if it remains 12, then you know you have the answer. So it's going to be 2.001 raised to the third minus 8 divided by 0 0.001. 2.001 to the third power is 8.012 minus 8 and then divide that by 0 0.001 so the answer is about 12.006 so notice that this is even closer to 12 so the answer is 12 now let's say if you get a question or a problem that looks like this How would you evaluate this limit? What would you do? So you could use direct substitution. It's always going to work. You can't directly substitute 9 because the square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. But you can plug in a number very close to 9. So let's find out what the value of 8.9 is. So 9 minus 8.9 divided by 3 minus square root 8.9. 9 minus 8.9 is 0.1, and 3 minus the square root of 8.9 is 0 0.016713, something like that. So 0 0.1 divided by that number gives you about 5.98. So that rounds to 6. So if we try 8.99, that's 9 minus 8.99 over 3 minus the square root of 8.99. 9 minus 8.99 is 0 0.01. 3 minus the square root of 8.99, that's going to be 0 0.0016713. So if you divide those two numbers, you should get 5.998 which is even closer to 6. So we can see that the final answer should be 6. But how can we get the answer without using a calculator? If you see a radical, you want to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate 
of the expression that contains the radical. So the conjugate of 3 minus radical x is 3 plus radical x. You simply have to change the sign from negative to positive. And whatever you do to the bottom, you have to do to the top. Now, for one of these, you want to FOIL, but for the other one, you don't. Wherever you see the conjugate, that's the part that you want to FOIL. Because those two differ only by sign, one is plus, the other is minus, you only want to FOIL the 3 minus root x and the 3 plus root x because the two middle terms will cancel. These two expressions, which are not conjugates of each other, do not FOIL it. Leave it in its factored form. If you FOIL it, life will be difficult and it's going to be much harder to solve it. Now let's go ahead and FOIL the denominator. So 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times root x is 3 root x. 3 times negative root x is negative 3 root x. And negative root x times root x, that's like negative root x squared, which is just negative x. Radical x times radical x, the square roots cancel, and you get what's inside, which is x. For example, square root 5 times square root 5 is the square root 25, since 5 times 5 is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. So you get the number that's on the inside. Now, on top, we're just going to leave it the way it is. So we can cancel these two terms. And so now what we have left over is this particular expression. At this point, we can cancel the 9 minus x. So now we have the limit as x approaches 9 for this function. So we can use substitution at this point. So it's going to be 3 plus the square root of 9. And the square root of 9 is 3. So 3 plus 3 is 6, which is the answer that we got with the calculator. So when you see a radical, multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. So here's an example that you can try out yourself and see if you can get the answer. So what is the limit as x approaches 0 for 4 plus x, or radical 4 plus x, minus root 4, divided by x? So just like before, we're going to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate, which is the same thing, but instead of a minus sign, it's going to be a plus sign. And whatever you do to the top of the fraction, you must do the same to the bottom of the fraction. So remember, only FOIL the conjugates. Do not FOIL these two or distribute the x to those two terms. Keep it in its factored form. Radical 4 plus x times radical 4 plus x the radicals will disappear and we're going to get what's on the inside, which is simply 4 plus x. Now we know the two middle terms will cancel, but I'm going to write it out if you want to see it. So radical 4 plus x times root 4 is simply root 4 root 4 plus x. And these two will be the same thing, but with a negative sign. Negative root 4 times root 4 is simply negative 4. The radicals will disappear. And on the bottom, we're going to leave it in its factored form. So now we can cancel. Notice that these two terms cancel. 4 plus negative 4 is 0. So what we now have left over is this expression. So notice that we can cancel the radical x at this point.
which means we can plug in 0 into the equation. So it's 1 minus the square root of 4 plus 0 plus root 4. So 4 plus 0 is 4, so we have root 4 plus root 4. The square root of 4 is 2, and 2 plus 2 is 4. So the final answer is 1 over 4. So that is it for that problem. Now what if you have a problem that looks like this? What should we do to evaluate the limit of this function? Whenever you have a complex fraction, what you need to do is multiply the top and the bottom, not by the conjugate, but by the common denominator. You want to multiply top and bottom by something that's going to clear away the fractions. So notice the denominator of those two fractions, x and 3. So the common denominator is 3x. So let's multiply the top and the bottom by 3x. Now for the top part, because we want to clear away the fraction, we're going to distribute the 3x. On a bottom, there's no need to do so. We don't have any fractions in the denominator, so we're going to leave it in its factored form. So 3x times 1 over x, what cancels? This is the same as 1 over x times 3x over 1. The x variables will cancel, and you'll be left with 3. So it's just going to be 3. Now what about 1 third times 3x? This time the 3's will cancel, and you're simply going to get x, but there's a negative sign in front of it. On the bottom, leave it in its factored form. Now can we cancel 3 minus x and x minus 3? They look very similar, but right now we can't cancel it yet. So what we need to do is take out a negative 1 from the numerator and reverse the terms. If we factor out negative 1, the negative x will change into positive x. And the positive 3 will turn into negative 3. So now at this point, we can cancel x minus 3. So we have the limit as x approaches 3 for the simplified function negative 1 over 3x which is going to be negative 1 over 3 times 3 and 3 times 3 is 9 so the final answer is negative 1 over 9 try this one So here we have another complex fraction. So we need to get rid of the 4 and the 4 plus x. So in this example, the common denominator is 4 times 4 plus x. And whatever you do to the top, you must also do to the bottom. So if we take 1 over 4 plus x and multiply it by 4 times 4 plus x, what cancels and what remains? Notice that the 4 plus x will cancel, and so the 4 will remain. So now, if we multiply this by 1 fourth, what cancels and what remains? Notice that the 4s will cancel, and the 4 plus x will remain. But don't forget, there's a negative sign in front. So it's going to be negative, and then the 4 plus x. And on the bottom, there was no fractions to clear away, so we're just going to rewrite it like this. x times 4 is simply 4x, so there's not much you can do there. Now, let's distribute the negative sign. Let's distribute the negative 1 to 4 and x. So what we now have is the limit as x approaches 0, 4 minus 4 minus x. 
Don't forget to distribute the negative sign to the x. So on top, we can cancel a 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. And so now we have negative x over 4x times 4 plus x. So we can cancel x. Now that this x is gone, we can substitute 0 into the equation. So we have a negative 1 on top. Remember, there's an invisible 1 left over. So once x is gone, only negative 1 is left over. So now we can replace x with 0. So it's going to be negative 1 times 4 and 4 plus 0. 4 plus 0 is simply 4, so we have 4 times 4 on the bottom which is 16, so the final answer is negative 1 over 16. So that's what you got to do for that problem. Now, what if you were to see a question that looks like this? It's a little bit longer and harder, but it can be solved. Go ahead and find the limit for this expression as x approaches 0. So notice that we have two radicals and we have a complex fraction. So should we multiply by the conjugate or by the common denominator? The answer is both. Personally I prefer to clear away the fractions before I multiply by the conjugate and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by radical x plus 5 times root 5. So if we take this term and distribute it to this one, notice that the root x plus 5's will cancel and the 5 will remain. So it's going to be just 5 on top, root 5 specifically. Now if we take this and multiply it by 1 over root 5, root 5 will cancel and we're going to have radical x plus 5 left over. And on the bottom, we're just going to leave it the way it is. So now that we cleared away the fractions, now it's a good time to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the numerator. So that's going to be root 5 plus root x plus 5. And on the bottom we're going to do the same thing but we're not going to foil it on the bottom or distribute it. So root 5 times root 5 is simply 5. This term will cancel with this term, so you can write it out if you want, but you know that it's going to cancel. And then finally, these two t terms will turn into a negative x plus 5. Root x plus 5 times root x plus 5 is simply x plus 5. The radicals will cancel. Now on the bottom, we're just going to write what we have. We have an x, a root x plus 5, root 5, and then in parentheses root 5 plus root x plus 5. You want to be careful with every step in a problem like this because if you make one mistake, that's it. The whole question is in ruins. So now let's distribute the negative 1. So it's 5 minus x minus 5 divided by everything that's in the bottom. So we can cancel 5. Plus 5 and negative 5 adds up to 0. Now what else can we cancel at this point? Do you see what we can cancel? Notice that we can cancel an x. 
and so we're going to have a negative 1 left over on the top. Now once we get rid of the x on the bottom, particularly this x, now we can substitute 0 into the equation. Now let's substitute x with 0. So it's going to be square root 0 plus 5, root 5, and then root 5 plus square root 0 plus 5. So 0 plus 5 is simply 5, so we have root 5 times root 5, and in parentheses root 5 plus root 5. So what's the square root of 5 times the square root of 5? If we multiply these two together, that's going to be the square root of 25. 5 times 5 is 25. Now, if you add root 5 plus root 5, it's like adding 1 plus 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, so you have 2 root 5. The square root of 25 is 5. So the final answer is going to be, well, we need to multiply 5 and 2, so that's 10. So it's 1 over 10 root 5. But Maybe that's not the final answer because we could rationalize the denominator. So let's multiply top and bottom by root 5. So on top is root 5. The square root of 5 times the square root of 5, we know it to be 5. So the final answer in its fully simplified form is the square root of 5 divided by 50. This is it. Now let's review some basic properties of limits. So let's say if the limit as x approaches c for the function f of x is equal to 4, and the limit as x approaches c for g of x is equal to 5. So based on this information, what is the limit as x approaches c for this expression, f of x plus g of x. What's the answer? All you need to do is simply add f and g. The value for f as x approaches c is 4, and for g it's 5. So you could just use substitution, and this is going to give you 9. So if you see a question like that, that's pretty much all you have to do to get the answer. Now what about this expression? The limit as x approaches c, f of x times g of x. So this expression is equal to the limit as x approaches c, f of x multiplied by the limit as x approaches c, g of x. So you just have to multiply f and g. So the value for f of x is 4, and for g is 5, so it's 4 times 5, which will give you a value of 20. Let's try another one. The limit as x approaches c for the function f of x squared. What's the answer? So this is the same as the limit as x approaches c for f of x but with the entire limit squared. It's the same thing. So this part is equal to 4. So it's 4 squared. 4 times 4 is 16. So that's the answer for that one. Let's try one more example. So this time the expression is going to be 3 f of x over g of x minus f of x. So f of x is equal to 4 as x approaches c. And for g it's 5, so it's going to be 5 minus 4. 3 times 4 is equal to 12, 
5 minus 4 is 1, and 12 divided by 1 is 12. So this is the final answer for this example. Consider the following piecewise function. So f of x is equal to 2x plus 1 when x is less than negative 3. And it's equal to x squared minus 14 when x is between negative 3 and 4. And then it equals 3x minus 4 when x is greater than 4. And it also equals 7 when x is equal to 4. So given this function, determine the points of discontinuity. Now within the piecewise function, we don't have any fractions, there's no radicals or logarithmic functions. So x could be anything. The only thing we have to look out for is negative 3 and 4. It may be continuous or it may not be at those two points. Whenever you have a fraction, the point of discontinuity usually occurs when the denominator is equal to 0. If you have a radical, just remember you can't have any negative numbers inside a, a square root if it's an if it has an even index number. And for logs, you can never have a zero or a negative number within a log. But we don't have any of that in this particular case. Now, if you want to quickly determine the points of discontinuity, plug in negative 3 into these two expressions. If they give you the same y value, then it's going to be continuous at negative 3. So 2 times negative 3 plus 1. That's negative 6 plus 1, which is negative 5. Now for the second expression, if we insert negative 3 into x, it's going to be negative 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 14 is negative 5. So because those two expressions have the same y value at x equals negative 3, it's going to be continuous at that point. Now, if we plug in 4 into these two expressions, let's see if we get the same y value. So, 4 squared minus 14, and 3 times 4 minus 4. 4 squared is 16, 16 minus 14 is 2. 3 times 4 is 12, 12 minus 4 is 8. Since these two do not equal each other, it is discontinuous at x equals 4. So that's how you can quickly tell if it's going to be continuous or discontinuous at a piecewise function. Now sometimes you may have to justify your work. So how can we use the three-step continuity test to prove that it's continuous at negative 3 but discontinuous at 4? And also determine the type of discontinuity at x equals 4. First, let's make sure that the function is defined at negative 3. So what is f of negative 3? Should we use this part of the function or the second part to find it? Notice that the underline is in the second part of the equation. So we have to plug in negative 3 into this equation, because that's when x can be equal to negative 3. So it's negative 3 squared minus 14. That's 9 minus 14, which is negative 5. So f of negative 3 is defined. Now what is the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left side? So for the left side, which function should we use? Should we use the 2x plus 1 or the x squared minus 14? The left side of negative 3 would be a number like negative 3.1. If you draw a number line, here's negative 3, 
negative 3.1 is to the left of negative 3, and negative 2.9 is to the right. Now, negative 3.1 is less than negative 3, so we have to use the first part of the function, 2x plus 1. So we're going to insert negative 3 into that equation, and that's going to give us negative 5. Now we also need to find the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right side. So we've got to use this function. And so that's going to be negative 3 squared minus 14, which is 9 minus 14. That's negative 5 as well. So because the left side and the right side limits because they're the same, the limit as x approaches negative 3 exists. And it's equal to negative 5. So now we can make the statement that the limit as x approaches negative 3 for f of x is equal to f of negative 3 because they both equal negative 5. And so that's how you can prove that it's continuous at x equals negative 3. Now let's prove that it's discontinuous at x equals 4. So first let's see if f of 4 is defined. What is the value of f of 4? So when x is exactly 4, what is the value of y? So x is 4 at this point, so y is 7. So the function is defined at x equals 4. Now what is the limit as x approaches 4 from the left side. So a number to the left of 4 is like 3.9, which is less than 4. So that's within this range between negative 3 and 4. So we have to use this part of the piecewise function. So it's going to be 4 squared minus 14, which is 16 minus 14, that's 2. Now what is the limit as x approaches 4 from the right side? So a number that's greater than 4, we need to use this equation, 3x minus 4. So that's 3 times 4 minus 4, which is 12 minus 4, and that's 8. So because the, the left side and the right side limit doesn't match, the limit does not exist. So therefore, it is discontinuous at x equals 4. Now what type of discontinuity do we have? So if we graph it, to the left side, we have a value of 2, and it's an open circle. And on the right side, we have a value of 8. So we have an open circle at 8. And we have a closed circle at 4, 7, which should be somewhere in this region. Now, this function is a parabola. So it's probably something that looks like this. Now, the right side, the 3x minus 4, it's a linear equation with a slope of 3. So it should have a shape, something like that. But notice that we have a jump discontinuity. The reason why it's a jump discontinuity is because the left sided limit and the right sided limit do not match. One was 2, the other is 8. Whenever you see that, it's going to be a jump discontinuity. Now consider this other piecewise function. 7x plus 1, and cx squared plus 3. And for this one, x is less than or equal to 2. And for the second part, x is greater than 2. Now sometimes you might see a question on a test that asks you to find the value of c that makes the expression or the piecewise function continuous at x equals 2. So what can we do to find that value of c. Now, for it to be continuous, they must have the same y value. 7x plus 1 
must be equal to cx squared plus 3 when x is 2. So set the two parts equal to each other and then replace x with 2. So it's going to be 7 times 2 plus 1 is equal to c times 2 squared plus 3. 7 times 2 is 14, 2 squared is 4, and 14 plus 1 is 15. So we have 15 is equal to 4c plus 3. So let's subtract 3 from both sides. 15 minus 3 is 12. And then let's divide both sides by 4. So 12 divided by 4 is 3. So c is equal to 3. At that point, the function will be continuous when c has a value of 3. Let's try one more example. So let's say if we have ax plus 7, 2x plus b, and ax squared minus 32. So for the first one, x is less than 1, and for the second, it's between 1 and 4. And for the last part, it's greater than or equal to 4. So find the value of a and b that will make this function continuous at x equals 1 and x equals 4. Feel free to pause the video as you work out this example. So we're going to have a system of equations. We need to set the first two equal to each other when x is equal to 1. So ax plus 7 will be equal to 2x plus b when x is 1. So let's plug in 1 into the equation. So 1a plus 7 is equal to 2 plus b. Now let's put a and b on the same side. So I'm going to move b to the left side and 7 to the right side. So let's subtract b from both sides. And let's subtract 7 on both sides. So these two will cancel. On the left, it's going to be a minus b. And on the right, 2 minus 7 is negative 5. So we get the expression a minus b is equal to negative 5. Now let's set the last two equal to each other when x is 4. So 2x plus b is equal to ax squared minus 32 when x is 4. So let's replace x with 4. Two times four is eight. Four squared, which is four times four, that's 16. So now let's try to get a and b by itself. So let's add 32 to both sides. And let's subtract b from both sides. So on the right side, we have 16a minus b. And on the left side, it's 40. So now let's solve the system of equations using elimination. You can use substitution if you want, but I chose to use elimination. So 16a minus b is equal to 40, and a minus b is equal to negative 5. When we add the two equations, we need to add it in such a way that b will cancel or a, but it's easier to cancel b. Let's multiply the second equation by negative 1. So the first equation is going to remain the same, but the second equation is going to be negative a plus b, which is equal to positive 5, if we multiply by negative 1. 
The reason why we did that is so that when we add the two equations, b will cancel. Negative b plus b is 0. So 16a plus negative a is 15a. 40 plus 5 is 45. So if we divide both sides by 15, we could see that a is equal to 3. Now that we have that, we could solve for b. Let's use this equation. So negative 3 plus b is equal to 5. So let's add 3 to both sides. So 5 plus 3 is 8, so b is equal to 8. So when a is 3 and b is 8, the function will be continuous at x equals 1 and at x equal 4. Now let's go over the greatest integer function. The greatest integer of x looks like this. So let's say if you want to find out what is the greatest integer of 2.4. What do you think the answer is? Here's a quick and simple way to find the answer. Let's put 2, 3, and 1 on a number line. Now where is 2.4 on the number line? 2.4 is somewhere in this region. So you want to pick the integer that is to the left of 2.4, which is 2. So the greatest integer of 2.4 is 2. You, you need to pick an integer that is less than or equal to 2.4. Now there are other numbers that are less than 2. 0, negative 1, negative 2, these are integers as well. But the greatest of these is 2. So that's why the answer is 2. So now let's try some more examples. What is the greatest integer of 3.9? negative 1.6 and negative 3.1 so go ahead and try these so let's focus on 3.9 so let's write 3 as a center 2 and 4 so 3.9 is very close to 4 but to find the greatest integer that's less than 3.9 pick the integer to the left of it so the answer is 3 now what about negative 1.6? So let's plot negative 1, 0, and negative 2. You always want to pick a number to the left and to the right. Now where is negative 1.6? Negative 1.6 is in this region. So we need to pick the integer that's to the left of negative 1.6, so it's negative 2. Now for the last one, we're going to plot negative 3, negative 4, and negative 2. Negative 3.1 is to the left of negative 3. So the greatest integer of negative 3.1, pick the integer to the left, which is negative 4. And so that's the answer. So now let's apply the greatest integer function to limits. What is the limit as x approaches 2 for the function 3 minus the greatest integer function of x. So what's the answer? Now, what you need to do is you need to find the left and the right side of limits. So first, let's find the left side of limit. What is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side? So let's say if we plug in a number that's less than 2. So like 1.9, that's to the left of 2. So 3 minus the greatest integer of 1.9. What's the answer? So if we plot 2, 3, and 1, 1 1.9 is over here. So any number to the left of 2, but that's very close to 2, is going to be in this region. And we got to pick the integer that's to the left, so that's 1. So the greatest integer of 1.9 is 1. So it's going to be 3 minus 1, which is 2. So that's the value for the left-sided limit. Now let's evaluate the right-sided limit. So what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side? So this time, we need to plug in a number 
that's very close to 2, but greater than 2, or from the right of 2. So we can try 2.1. So if we make the number line, here's 2, this is 1, this is 3. 2 to the right is in this region. So what is the greatest integer of 2.1? So pick the integer to the left of 2.1, which is 2. So it's going to be 3 minus 2, which is 1. Now, because the left-sided and the right-sided limits, because they're not the same, the limit does not exist. They don't match. The one-sided limits, they do exist, but the limit itself, as x approaches 2 from either sides, does not exist. Try this one. The limit as x approaches 3, well, actually, negative 3, for the expression 4 plus the greatest integer of x. So let's start with the left side. So negative 3 from the left. So pick a number that's to the left of negative 3. So if we draw a number line, here's negative 3, this is negative 4, and negative 2. So to the left of negative 3 is the number between negative 3 and negative 4. So let's try negative 3.1. So what is the greatest integer of negative 3.1? So we got to pick the integer to the left, which is negative 4. So it's going to be 4 plus negative 4, which is 0. So that's the value of the left-sided limit. So now let's do the same for the right-sided limit. The limit as x approaches 3, or negative 3, but from the right. So if we pick a value to the right of negative 3. This should be something like negative 2.9. So we got to find out the value of 4 plus the greatest integer of negative 2.9. The greatest integer of negative 2.9 is the number to the left, which is negative 3. So it's 4 plus negative 3, and that's equal to 1. So once again, the left-sided and the right-sided limits do not match, so therefore, the limit as x approaches negative 3 from either side for this greatest integer function does not exist. Let's try one more for the sake of practice. So pause the video and try this example. So what is the limit as x approaches negative 4 for the function 5 minus the greatest integer of negative x? So be careful with this one. So let's start with the left side. So let's draw the number line. And let's put negative 4 in the middle. And then let's choose 1 to the left and 1 to the right. So pick a number that's to the left of negative 4. So this could be negative 4.1. And let's plug it in. So it's 5 minus the greatest integer of negative, and then negative 4.1. There's two negatives on the inside. So this is 5 minus positive 4.1. So if we draw another number line, and let's put 4 in the middle, 4.1 is to the right of 4. So the greatest integer of 4.1 is 4 if we take it one unit to the left. So this is going to be 5 minus 4, which is 1. So now, let's check the right side. Let's evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 4 from the right. So let's begin with a number line. And let's pick one number to the left of negative 4 and one to the right. So this time, we got to pick a number that's to the right of negative 4. So we're going to choose negative 3.9. So let's plug it in. So it's going to be negative negative 3.9, which is the same as 5 minus the greatest integer of positive 3.9. So let's make a new number line. So we're going to have 3, 4, 
and 5. So 3.9 is somewhere between 3 and 4. So we got to pick the integer to the left of 3.9, which is 3. So then this is going to be 5 minus 3, which is 2. So that's the limit for the right side. So because the left side and the right side do not match, the limit does not exist. What is the limit as x approaches 5 for the function 7 divided by x minus 5? What's the answer? Now, if we try to use direct substitution, it's going to be 7 over 0. So if you plug in 5, you, it's going to be undefined. You can't have a 0 in the bottom. Now, as x approaches 5, let's say if it's like 5.1. Let's see what happens if we plug in 5.1. This is going to be 7 over 5.1 minus 5, which is 7 over 0.1, which is 70. If we plug in, let's say, 5.01, On the bottom, it's going to be 0 0.01, and 7 divided by that is going to be 700. So notice that as we approach 5, it's increasing to infinity. So whenever you get a 0 on the bottom, and if you can't factor and cancel it out, like as if it's a whole, your possible answers are it may not exist, it's positive infinity, or negative infinity if you can't cancel the zero out of the uh, equation. So let's figure out which of these three answers do we have. And to do that, we need to find the left and right side limits. So let's start with the right side. So let's see if it's positive infinity, negative infinity, or it doesn't exist. So if we plug in a number, let's say like 5.1, we know we're going to get a positive answer, positive 70. If we plug in 5.01, it was 700. So therefore, we can say that the limit as x approaches 5 from the right side is going to be positive infinity because we got a positive number. If you plug in 5.001, it's going to be 7,000. It's going to keep increasing. Now, what about the limit as x approaches 5 from the left? Is it going to be positive infinity, negative infinity, or it doesn't exist? So let's say if we plug in 4.9. This is 7 divided by negative 0.1, which is negative 70. So it's a very large but negative number. If you plug in 4.99, it's going to be negative 700. So we can say that it's going to approach negative infinity. Because the left side and the right side do not match, the limit as x approaches 5 does not exist. Another good example is this function. So if we check the left side, is it going to be positive infinity, negative infinity, or doesn't exist? So if you plug in a small number to the left of 0, like negative 0.1, this is negative 10. If you plug in a smaller number that's even closer to 0, like negative 0 0.01, that's negative 100. So notice that as x approaches 0 from the left, it's going to approach negative infinity. Now, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right side, it's going to be positive infinity because we're plugging in a positive number. 1 over positive 0 0.01 is 100. 1 divided by positive 0 0.001, which is even closer to 0, that's a 1,000. So as you can see, as we approach 0, it's going to be positive infinity. If you plug in exactly 0, it's undefined, if it's exactly 0. But if you plug in a number that's very close to 0, you're going to get a large number. It could be positive or negative. Now, because the left side and the right side do not match, the limit does not exist. Another way to understand the answer is to graph the function. The graph of 1 over x looks like this. 
So you can see there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Whenever you take the limit of a number, if it approaches positive or negative infinity, you have a vertical asymptote at that point. So you can see the limit as x approaches 0 from the right side for 1 over x. If we follow the curve, notice it goes up towards positive infinity. And the limit as x approaches 0 from the left side, if we follow the curve, starting from the left, it goes down to negative infinity. So therefore, the limit doesn't exist. Let's try some more examples. So what is the limit as x approaches 3 for this function? Negative 7 divided by x minus 3. So let's analyze the right side first, or the left side. So typically, for these rational expressions, if you can't cancel the x minus 3, the left side of limits and the right side of limits is probably going to be positive or negative infinity. So you just got to look out for the sign. You just got to find out if it's going to be positive or negative. So 3 to the left, a number that's to the left of 3 would be like 2.9. So negative 7 is a negative number, and 2.9 minus 3 is a negative number. So the answer should be positive or positive infinity. You just got to check the signs to see if it's positive or negative. To test it, if you plug in, let's say, 2.99, negative 7 divided by 2.99 minus 3, make sure to put 2.99 minus 3 in parentheses, you get positive 700 you get a large positive number which is going to approach infinity as x approaches 3 from the left. Now for the other side, the limit as x approaches 3 from the right, we know that the top number is still going to be negative, but on the bottom it's going to be 3.1 minus 3, since 3.1 is to the right of 3 on the number line. Now 3.1 minus 3 is a positive number. A negative and a positive, when divided or multiplied, is a negative number. So this is going to be negative infinity. So since these two do not match, the limit does not exist. Now what is the limit as x approaches 4 of the function 5 over 4 minus x? So what's the answer? So once again, check the signs. Let's start with the left side. So pick a number that's to the left of 4. So a good number to pick would be 3.9. So 5 is positive. 4 minus 3.9 is positive. So this is going to be positive infinity. Now what about 4 from the right side? So let's pick 4.1 since that's to the right of 4. So the 5 is still a positive number, but 4 minus 4.1 is a negative number, and so this is going to be negative infinity, which means that the limit doesn't exist because these two do not match. Now what about this one? Does the limit exist, or is the answer the same? as the other ones. So let's try it. Let's start with the left side. So what is the limit as x approaches 1 from the left? So let's pick 0.9 since that's to the left of 1. So it's going to be 2 minus 0.9 and 0.9 minus 1 squared. 2 minus 0.9 is positive 1.1 so it's a positive number and 0.9 minus 1 is negative 0.1. But when you square it, negative 0.1 times negative 0.1 is a positive number. So positive divided by a positive number is going to be positive infinity. Now if we plug in a number to the right of 1, let's say 1.1, 2 
2 minus 1.1 is positive 0.9. Now 1.1 minus 1 is positive 0.1, and when you square it, it's still going to be positive. So the left side and the right side limits, they agree because of the square. So therefore, the limit is equal to positive infinity. How about this one? What is the limit as x approaches 0 for the absolute value of x divided by x? What's the answer? Well, let's check the left side first. So what's going to happen if we plug in negative 0.1? The absolute value of negative 0.1 is positive 0.1. The absolute value function will change any number and make it positive. So if it's positive, it's going to stay positive. If it's negative, it's going to become positive. But we still have the negative 0.1 on the bottom. So this is going to give us negative 1. The 0.1s will cancel. Now what happens if we plug in a number that's closer to 0 from the left? So let's say if we try negative 0.01. The absolute value of negative 0.01 is positive 0.01. So these two will cancel, and you're going to get the same answer, negative 1. So as we approach 0 from the left, notice that the answer didn't change. It remained negative 1, which means that that's what it is. The limit as x approaches 0 from the left, because it didn't change, it's going to equal negative 1. Now what about the limit as x approaches 0 from the right? What's the answer? If you plug in positive 0.1, you're going to get 1. The absolute value of 0.1 is 0.1. And if you plug in 0 0.01, you're going to get 1. Now, it helps to understand how the absolute value function works. The absolute value of x can equal two things. It's basically a piecewise function. It equals x when x is greater than 0. It equals negative x when x is less than 0. So for this part, to the left of 0, what we can really say is that it's equal to negative x when x is less than 0. And that's how we get negative 1. Now for the other part, the absolute value of x is equal to x when x is greater than 0. And so that's why we get positive 1, because x divided by x is 1. Now, because the left side and the right side limits do not match, the limit does not exist. If we graph the function, it's going to look like this. It can either be 1 or a negative 1. And it's going to be an open circle at these two points. So if x is greater than 0, it's going to be positive 1. If it's less than 0, negative 1. And so you can see the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, it approaches a value of negative 1. And the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, you can see it's going to equal positive 1. But notice that we have a jump discontinuity. So because the two lines do not connect, the limit does not exist as x approaches 0 from either side. Now, let's say if you have a question like this, limit as x approaches 0, I mean 3 instead of 0 this time, for the absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3. So when you evaluate the one-sided limits, because these two can cancel, it's either going to be 1 or negative 1. So let's try, let's start with the left side. So let's plug in a number less than 3, let's say 2.9. So the absolute value of 2.9 minus 3 divided by 2.9 minus 3. 
2.9 minus 3 is negative 0.1. And on the top, the negative 0.1 is going to change to positive 0.1. So therefore, this is going to be negative 1. And then, as x approaches 3 from the right, let's try 3.1. So it's going to be 3.1 minus 3, top and bottom. So 3.1 minus 3 is 0.1, and the absolute value of 0.1 is 0.1, so this is going to be positive 1. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Now, don't forget, we can break down the absolute value of x minus 3 into two equations, x minus 3 and negative x minus 3. So it's going to be x minus 3 when x is greater than 3. And it's going to be negative when it's less than 3. So 3 to the left is less than 3. So we're going to use negative x minus 3. And so this is going to give you negative 1. You could also do it this way. 3 to the right is greater than 3. So that's simply going to be just x minus 3, which these two will cancel. And that's going to give you positive 1. So you can evaluate it that way as well. So pick a method that you find easier to work with that you're going to remember when you take the test. So let's try this example. This time I'm going to use the second method. Now the absolute value of x minus 2 is x minus 2 when x is greater than 2. And it's going to be negative x minus 2 when x is less than 2. So keep that in mind. So now let's evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. So that would be like 1.9. Therefore, x is less than 2. So the absolute value is going to equal the negative version, which is negative x minus 2. Now, on top, it's going to stay the same. So we can cancel these two. So what we now have is one left over on top and a negative one on the bottom, since we had two of them. So at this point, we can use direct substitution. We can plug in two. So it's two minus two over negative one, which is simply zero. Now, what about the limit as x approaches two from the right? So it's still going to be x minus 2 squared on top. Because this is to the right of 2, the absolute value of x minus 2 is equal to the positive version. So it's simply x minus 2 without the negative sign. So these will cancel as well. And so it's going to be x minus 2 divided by positive 1. But we can use direct substitution. So 2 minus 2 is still 0. So therefore, for this particular case, the limit does exist. It equals 0. Try this one. So what is the limit as x approaches pi over 2 for tan x? What's the answer? So pi over 2 is approximately 90 degrees. Let's look at the left side and the right side. So to the left of 90 is like 89.9. So if you plug in tan 89.9 in the calculator, make sure it's in degree mode, you should get about 573, approximately. Now if you type in tan 89.99, This is going to be about 5,730. 
So notice that as x approaches 90 degrees from the left, or pi over 2, tangent approaches positive infinity. Now what about the limit as x approaches 90, or pi over 2, from the right side? So pick a number that's greater than 90, but close to it. So if we plug in tangent 90.1, you should get negative 573. And if you type in tan 90.01, you should get negative 5730. So therefore, the limit as x approaches 90 or pi over 2 from the right side is negative infinity. And since the left and right side of limits do not match, the limit does not exist. Now, let's get the answer using a graph. The graph of tangent has a vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The period is pi, so the next vertical asymptote is at 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 and pi over 2 differs by pi. And tangent is an increase in function, so it looks like this. And it's going to repeat. So this pattern will continue to repeat. But we're going to focus on pi over 2. So as we approach pi over 2 from the left side, notice that it goes to positive infinity. So from the left side, we plugged in 89.9. And we got positive infinity. As we approach pi over 2 from the right side, it becomes negative infinity. And that's why the limit doesn't exist. Now you can also get the signs using a unit circle. Pi over 2, or 90, is in the positive y axis. So as we approach 90 from the left side, meaning 89.9, notice that we're in quadrant 1. The tangent is positive in quadrant 1. That's why it's positive infinity when we plug in 89.9. To the right of 90, which is like 90.1, 90.1 is in quadrant 2. And in quadrant 2, tangent is negative. So one side of pi over 2 is negative, the other is positive. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. Now, what about this one? The limit as x approaches 0 for the secant function. What's the answer? Secant is 1 divided by cosine. And notice that we can solve it using direct substitution. What is cosine 0? Now if you type in cosine 0, you should get 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. So that's the limit for this particular problem. Now what is the limit as x approaches pi over 2 for the secant x function. What's the answer? Now secant is 1 over cosine. And cosine pi over 2 is 0. So if you plug in exactly 0, it's going to be undefined. But if we plug in a number close to 0, well, maybe we can get the answer. So let's try 90 from the left side. Now, we know it's either going to be positive infinity or negative infinity because we can't cancel cosine. We just got to know what the sign is. So to the left of 90, which is like 89.9, that's in quadrant 1. Cosine, which is associated with the x value, is positive in quadrant 1. So we could say this is going to be positive infinity. Now, as x approaches 90, or pi over 2 from the right side, that's like 90.1, that's quadrant 2. Cosine is negative in quadrant 2, so it's negative infinity. Since these two do not match, the limit does not exist. Now, let's analyze it graphically. The graph of cosine looks like this. I'm going to draw it with dotted lines. That's the cosine function. Secant, which is 1 over cosine, 
you can graph it this way. Wherever there is, wherever the cosine graph touches the x-axis, draw a vertical line. It's going to be a vertical asymptote at that point. Now to graph the secant function, simply draw the reciprocal of the cosine function. So now we need to look at the x values. This is 0, pi over 2, pi, well, actually that's 3 pi over 2. Pi is in the middle. This is 3 pi over 2. But we need to focus on pi over 2. So what is the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the left? 89.9, so to speak. As we approach pi over 2 from the left, notice that the curve, if we follow it, it goes up to positive infinity, which is the answer that we got. Cosine 89.9 is positive because it's in quadrant 1. So the left side was positive. Now the right side, if we follow it, as x approaches 90 from the right side, it goes down to negative infinity. We said that 90.1 is in quadrant 2, and cosine is negative in quadrant 2, so that's why we were able to pick negative infinity. Nevertheless, these two limits do not match, so therefore the limit overall does not exist. Try these. Sine 3x over 5x, 2x over sine 7x, and sine 9x over 8x. If you see a question like this, what's the answer? If you have a multiple choice test and you want to know what the answer is, the first one is simply 3 over 5. The second is 2 over 7. The last one is 9 over 8. You can use direct substitution to prove it. So make sure your calculator is in radian mode. And let's plug in a number that's very close to 0. So let's choose 0 0.1. So sine 3 times 0 0.01 divided by 5 times 0 0.01. If you type this in, you should get 0.59991, which is approximately 0 0.6. 0 0.6, if you convert it to a fraction, multiply top and bottom by 10, which is 6 over 10. And if you divide the top and bottom by 2, you get 3 over 5. So 3 over 5 is the same as 0.6. So direct substitution always work if you plug in a number very close to 0. So that's how you can quickly get the answer. But sometimes on a test, they may want you to justify the answer. So let's justify the first one. Now, there's a rule that you need to know. And here it is. The limit as x approaches 0 for sine x over x is equal to 1. So that's a rule that you simply have to know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply top and bottom by 3. Now 5 times 3 is the same as 3 times 5. Both of these expressions is equal to 15. So I can switch the 5 and the 3. So the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 3x divided by 3x times 3 over 5. Now, since these two are the same, you can see that this whole thing is going to become 1. So it's 1 times 3 over 5. But to show your work, we're not finished yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace 3x with y. So we're going to say y is equal to 3x. So therefore, as x approaches 0, y is going to approach 0. If you plug in 0 into 3x, y is going to be 0. So therefore, we could say the limit as y approaches 0 of sine y 
divided by y times 3 over 5. So we can now see that this combined expression is equal to 1. So it's 1 times 3 over 5, and the final answer is 3 over 5. Now sometimes you might see a tangent in the problem. So what is the limit as x approaches 0? 5x over tan 4x. The answer is 5 over 4. But let's show work. Let's multiply top and bottom by 4. And on the top, let's switch 5 and 4. So it's 4x over tangent x. But I'm going to write it as 4x over 1 times 1 over tangent 4x times 4 over 4. So this expression is the same as 4x over tangent x. Now tangent is sine over cosine. So 1 over tangent is cosine over sine. So on top, I have cosine 4x. On the bottom, sine 4x times... This is supposed to be a 5, not a 4. So times 5 over 4. Now I'm going to take this and move it over here. So now we have 4x divided by sine x times cosine 4x over 1. Well, this is sine 4x, by the way. Let's not forget that. So now we're going to say y is equal to 4x. And so as x approaches 0, y is going to approach 0. And so let's replace 4x with y. So it's y over sine y times this 4x is now also y, so cosine y times 5 over 4. So as y approaches 0, y divided by sine y is 1. So this entire expression, that's going to be 1. Now the limit as y approaches 0 for cosine y is going to be cosine 0, and then times 5 over 4. Cosine 0 is 1, so our final answer is 5 over 4. Here's another trig problem. What is the limit as x approaches 0 for the function 1 minus x divided by cosine x? So for this one, we can use direct substitution. So it's 1 minus 0 divided by cosine 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. Cosine 0 is 1. So the whole thing is simply 1. Now what if you have a natural log? What is the limit as x approaches 0 for the ln x function? What's the answer? So let's check the left side and the right side. So what is the limit as x approaches 0 from the left side? So what is ln negative 0 0.01? If you plug in ln negative 0 0.01 into the calculator, it's going to say error. You can never have a negative inside a natural log. It doesn't work. It's not part of the domain for natural logs. So the left side of limit does not exist. The right side of limit does. If you plug in ln 0.1, you're going to get a negative number. It's going to be negative 2.3. If you plug in ln 0.01, it's negative 4.6. If you plug in ln 0.000001, it's negative 13.8. Notice that the negative number is increasing, it's becoming more negative. And even though it's doing it at a slow rate, eventually it's going to approach negative infinity. Since the left side and the right side do not match, the limit does not exist. Now let's analyze this function graphically. 
the natural log function has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And it's an increase in function, but it increases at a decrease in rate. So as you can see, there's nothing on the left side. So that's why the limit as x approaches 0 from the left does not exist, because there's nothing there. But the limit as x approaches 0 from the right does exist, because as you follow the curve towards 0 from the right side, it goes down to negative infinity. So only the right side of limit exists for natural log for this particular example. So what is the limit as x approaches 5 for the function ln x minus 5? And also find the left sided limit and the right sided limit. If you graph the function, the vertical asymptote is now at positive 5. It's been shifted 5 units to the right. To find the vertical asymptote, set the inside part equal to 0 and solve for x. So you'll get x is equal to 5. So the graph looks like this. So on the left side, there's nothing. So let's call the function f of x. So the left side does not exist. But the right side, as we approach 5 from the right, it goes down to negative infinity. Now, since the left side doesn't exist, the limit overall does not exist. If you plug in 5.1 into x minus 5, you're going to get a positive number, so that exists. If you plug in 4.9 into x minus 5, that's negative 0.1, that will not exist because it's negative. And you can't have a negative number inside a natural log or a log. So try this one. What is the limit as x approaches 4 for ln 4 minus x? So the limit as x approaches 4 from the right, does it exist? So if we plug in 4.1, 4, 4 minus 4.1 is a negative number. So that's not going to exist. So if we plug in 4 from the left side, let's say 3.9, 4 minus 3.9 is a positive number, so that will exist. And so this is the one that's going to be negative infinity. Now, if you graph it, by the way, uh, this limit does not exist. The vertical asymptote is at 4. If you set 4 minus x equal to 0, x is 4. But notice that we have a negative sign in front of the x. So it's going to reflect. It's going to go towards the left instead of the right. It's not going to go this way. But because it's negative x, it's going to go towards quadrant 2. It's going to go that way. So that's why the right side of limit doesn't work. But the left side of limit does work. So you can analyze it graphically, or you can plug in numbers. So as we approach 4 from the left side, it goes down to negative infinity. What is the limit as x approaches 0 for the function e to the x? In this case, we can use direct substitution. You can replace x with 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So for that one, it's not bad. Now what is the limit as x approaches 0 for the function x squared times sine 1 over x. For this type of problem, you need to use something called the squeeze term. So let's say if you have three functions where g is greater than f but less than h. And let's say if you know that the limit as x approaches 0 for f, let's say it's 3, and the limit as x approaches 0 for h is also 3. If these two are true, 
then the limit for the function in the middle must be equal to the limit of f and h. So the limit for g of x must also be equal to 3. So that's the main idea behind the squeeze term. So we need to come up with two functions. So let's say g of x, the middle one, is x squared sine x sine times 1 over x. Now whenever you graph a sine wave, it varies between 1 and negative 1. It's always going to vary between those two numbers. So sometimes sine will be negative 1, and other times sine will be positive 1. So therefore, the lowest value that we can get for this function is negative x squared. Because the lowest that sine can be is negative 1. The highest that sine can be is positive 1. So we can say the lowest value of the function is negative x squared, and the highest value is positive x squared. So this function is between negative x squared and positive x squared. So let's find the limit as x approaches 0 for the lower part of the function, that's f of x, which is simply negative x squared. So if you plug in 0, you're going to get 0. And then the limit, which is the upper part of the function, the limit as x approaches 0 for the upper part, or x squared, is also going to be 0. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 0 for the function in between, that's in between negative x squared and x squared, this should also equal 0. And so that's the main idea behind the squeeze term. And typically, you can identify because you'll see sine or cosine multiplied by some monomial. Try this one. The limit as x approaches 0, x cubed and cosine 5 over x. So cosine, like sine, can vary between negative 1 and positive 1. So the function with the lowest value is x cubed times negative 1, since that's the lowest that cosine can be. So it's a negative x cubed. This is going to be equal to 0. Now the upper function, or the highest function, the highest that cosine can be is positive 1. So that's 1 times x cubed. And as x approaches 0, it's going to be 0. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 0 for the function x cubed cosine 5 over x is equal to 0. By the way, you also want to make the statement, probably in the beginning we should have done it, but make the statement that x cubed cosine 5 over x is between x cubed and negative x cubed. As long as you make that statement, you should be fine. But it's important for you to make that a statement so you can justify the use of the squeeze term. Now what is the limit as x approaches infinity for 1 over x? When you divide a number by a very small number, you get a large number. But if you divide by a large number, you get a small number. 1 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.001, and 1 divided by 0 0.001 is 1,000. So make sure you understand that concept. When you divide by a small number, you get a large number. When you divide by a large number, you get a small number. For example, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right side for 1 over x is positive infinity. If you plug in 0 0.01, 1 divided by 0 0.01 is 100. 1 divided by 0 0.001 is 1,000. So it's going to continue to increase towards positive infinity. Now the reverse is true. The limit as x approaches infinity for 1 over x is 0. So if you substitute x with infinity, when you divide by a large number, make sure you know that this is 0. So anytime infinity is on the bottom, it's going to equal 0. This is the horizontal asymptote of the function. Whenever you have a function that's bottom heavy, 
where the degree of the denominator is greater than that of the numerator, the horizontal asymptote is y is equal to 0. So limits at infinity will produce the horizontal asymptote. But when x approaches a number and y approaches infinity, this is the vertical asymptote. So make sure you know the difference. When x approaches infinity and when y approaches a number, that's the horizontal asymptote. But when x approaches a number and if y approaches infinity, it's associated with the vertical asymptote. Now what is the limit as x approaches infinity for the function 5 divided by x squared? So it's bottom heavy. 5 divided by infinity squared is simply 5 over infinity. A large number squared is going to be another large number. And 5 divided by infinity is 0. So whenever you have a number divided by infinity, it's always going to be 0. Now what about this one? What is the limit as x approaches infinity? for the polynomial function 7x plus x squared minus 5x cubed. What you really need to focus on is the term with the highest degree, which is the 5x cubed. When x becomes very large, 7x and x squared will be insignificant compared to 5x cubed. So this expression is equivalent to the limit as x approaches infinity for negative 5x cubed. So if we replace x with infinity, infinity to the third is an infinity. Negative times positive infinity is going to be negative infinity. This is the answer. And you can check it. Let's say if x is 1,000. So it's going to be 7,000. 1,000 times 1,000 is a million. And 1,000 to the third power that's like nine zeros, that's going to be five billion. The 7,000 is insignificant to the million. If you add these two, that's a million and 7,000, but minus five billion. A million minus five billion is still roughly about five billion. But let's type it in. A million seven thousand minus five billion is about negative four billion nine hundred ninety eight thousand nine hundred ninety three I mean nine hundred ninety eight million and then nine hundred ninety three thousand. So this rounds to approximately negative five billion. And that's why we could ignore these terms. And so the final answer is negative or negative infinity. So for a polynomial, simply focus on the term with the highest degree. And you can quickly get the answer. Or you can use direct substitution. Now let's try some more examples. What is the limit as x approaches negative infinity for the function 3x minus x squared? So 3x is insignificant to x squared, so this is approximately equal to the expression limit as x approaches negative infinity from negative x squared. So at this point, let's use substitution. So negative, negative infinity squared. Negative infinity times negative infinity is positive infinity. And negative times positive infinity overall is negative infinity. So if you plug in 1,000 or negative 1,000 for x, you're going to get approximately negative 1 million or a very large negative number. Now try this one. What is the limit as x approaches negative infinity for the function 4x squared minus 9x cubed? So 4x squared is insignificant to 9x cubed. So this is equivalent to the limit as x approaches negative infinity for negative 9x cubed. So that's going to be negative 9 times negative infinity to the third power. If you raise a negative three times, the result will still be negative. But negative nine times negative infinity will be positive infinity. Two negatives turn into a positive. So if you plug in negative a thousand, your final answer should be a very large positive number, probably close to nine billion. 
what is the limit as x approaches positive infinity for the function 7 over 5x plus 3. So notice that the function is bottom heavy. The degree of the denominator is higher than that of the numerator. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be 0. So this is going to be 7 divided by 5 times infinity plus 3. 5 times infinity is infinity, and infinity plus 3 is infinity. So this is about 7 over infinity. And whenever you have infinity on the bottom, it's 0. So that's the way that we can quickly get the answer. But let's justify our answer. So if you have to show work, here's what you can do. Multiply the top and the bottom by 1 over x. So on top, we have the expression 7 divided by x. And on the bottom, if we distribute 1 over x, it's going to be 5 plus 3 over x. 1 over x times 5x, the x's will cancel, and you're left with 5. Now, whenever you have an x in the bottom of a fraction, the limit as the x approaches infinity will make it 0, based on this fact. The limit as the x approaches infinity for a constant divided by x is always equal to 0. So 7 over x will turn into 0. The 5 will remain 5. The 3 over x will become 0. 0 divided by 5 is 0. Try this one. The limit as x approaches negative infinity for the function 8 minus 3x divided by x plus 2. So notice that the degree of the numerator is the same as that of the denominator. To get the answer quickly, simply divide by the coefficients. The most significant term in the numerator is the negative 3x. The 8 is irrelevant or insignificant to the negative 3x. 2 is insignificant to x. So you can cancel x and you can see that it's going to be negative 3 over 1 or negative 3. But now let's show work. So let's multiply the top and the bottom by 1 over x. So it's going to be 8 divided by x minus 3 over x times 1 over x is 1, and then plus 2 over x. So as x approaches negative infinity, 8 over x will turn into 0. And 2 over x will also become 0. So it's going to be negative 3 over 1, which is negative 3. Try this one. What's the limit as x approaches infinity for this function? 8x to the third plus 7x divided by 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 9, and on the outside, plus 3. So notice that the degree of the top and the bottom is the same. So to get the answer quickly, divide the coefficients. 8 divided by 2 is 4, but don't forget to add the plus 3 on the outside. So the answer is going to be 7. But let's show work. So let's multiply the top and the bottom part of the fraction by, this time, 1 over x cubed. You want to multiply it by the term with the highest degree. So 8x cubed times 1 over x cubed. The x cubes will cancel, and it's just going to be 8. Now, 7x times 1 over x cubed. And x will cancel, and we're going to have x squared on the bottom. 1 over x cubed times 2x cubed. The x cubes will cancel, and it's just going to be 2. 4x squared times 1 over x cubed x squared will cancel, leaving a single x on the bottom. And for the last one, it's 9 over x cubed. So as x approaches infinity, any part or any fraction that is bottom heavy will be 0. So 7 over x squared is bottom heavy. That's going to turn into 0. Oh, let's not forget the plus 3 on the outside, by the way. Now, 4 over x and 9 over x cubed 
they're bottom heavy so they will turn into zero and then we have the plus three on the outside so eight divided by two is four plus the three will give us an answer of seven now let's try another problem what is the limit as x approaches infinity for the function 6x plus 5 divided by the square root of 9x squared plus 8. Okay, so let's see if we can quickly get the answer. So 5 is insignificant relative to 6x, and 8 is insignificant relative to 9x squared. So this expression simplifies to this. 6x divided by the square root of 9x squared. The square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of x squared is x. So it's 6x divided by 3x, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. So the answer is 2. So let's use direct substitution to see if we can get the same answer. Let's assume x is 1,000. 6 times 1,000 plus 5 is 6,005. Now, 1,000 squared is a million times 9 plus 8. That's about 9 million and 8. The square root of 9 million and 8 is about 3,000.0013. So when you divide these two numbers, 6,005 divided by 3,000.0013, you're going to get about 2.00167, which is approximately about 2. So we know the final answer is 2, because it works if you use direct substitution. But now, how can we justify our answer? So what we need to do is multiply top and bottom by 1 over x. So on top, it's going to be 6x times 1 over x is 6, and then plus 5 over x. Now, how can we multiply a square root by 1 over x? How can we take the 1 over x and put it inside the square root? So let's say if you have 2 times the square root of 3. You can change the 2 into the square root of 4. You can square it, and you can square root it. The square root of 4 is 2. And then once you square it, now you can multiply the 4 and 3, which is 12. So we're going to do the same thing. So the square root of 9x squared plus 8 times 1 over x is the same as the square root of 1 over x squared. If you take the square root of 1 over x squared, it's going to be equal to 1 over x. So now that both numbers, or both expressions, are within a radical, we can multiply what's inside of those two radicals. 9x squared times 1 over x squared, the x squareds will cancel, so it's just going to be 9. And then 8 times 1 over x squared is 8 over x squared. So now let's apply the limit. So the functions that are bottom heavy, the 5 over x and the 8 over x squared, will turn into 0. 9 plus 0 is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So we get the same answer. Now, what is the answer for this expression? Use any method that suits you for this example. Relative to the 64x to the 4, the 5x is insignificant, and 3 is insignificant relative to 4x squared. The square root of 64 is 8. And the square root of x to the fourth is x squared, so we get 8x squared over 4x squared. So the final answer for this one should be 2.
Now, what if you get a problem that looks like this? Let's say if it's not in the form of a fraction. 9x squared plus x minus 3x. So, because we don't have a fraction, we can't just say x is insignificant. Because this would be 3x minus 3x, which is 0, and that's not correct. So, in this case, we can't just rule out x. Now, you could use direct substitution. So, let's plug in 1,000. So, this is going to be 9 million plus 1,000 minus 3,000. The square root of 9 times 1,000 squared, or 9 million, plus 1,000 is about 3,000. 0.1666 minus 3 times 1,000. So the final answer is 0.1666, which is approximately 1 over 6. So it does appear to converge to a certain value. Let's see if we can find that value analytically. So what we need to do is turn it into a fraction, and then multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. That's plus 3x. I'm out of space. Whatever you do to the bottom, you got to do to the top as well. So on top, we're going to FOIL. These two, when multiplied together, is going to be 9x squared plus x. The radicals will cancel. And then the first and the last is going to cancel with 3x and square root 9x squared plus x. And then the last two, negative 3x times 3x, is going to be negative 9x squared. Now on the bottom, we're just going to leave it the way it is. So we can cancel 9x squared. And so we're left with the limit as x approaches infinity, x on top, on the bottom, square root 9x squared plus x plus 3x. So what can we do at this point? So notice that now that we have a fraction, we could say x is insignificant to 9x squared. Focus on the powers. This power is to the first power, 3x is to the first power, and if you were to take the square root of 9x squared, this would be 3x to the first power. So you don't want to get rid of 3x, nor do you want to get rid of 9x squared. But to show our work, let's multiply the top and the bottom by, let's see, radical 1 over x. So it's going to be x root 1 over x. And if we distribute it here, it's going to be 9x squared times 1 over x is simply 9x. And x times 1 over x is 1. And then for the last one, it's 3x times root 1 over x. Okay, this expression does look weird. And let's go back for a moment. We need to change something. Instead of multiplying by 1 over x, let's multiply by the square root of 1 over x squared. Now keep in mind, the square root of 1 over x squared is the same as 1 over x. So on top, what we really have is x times 1 over x. 
x times 1 over x, the x's will cancel, giving you 1. So we have the limit as x approaches infinity, and so we have a 1 on top. Now on the bottom, 9x squared times 1 over x squared, they're both inside the radical. So we're not going to use 1 over x, just 1 over x squared. The x squareds will cancel, and so it's going to be 9, but inside the radical. Now, x times 1 over x squared is going to become 1 over x. So you can see why that number was insignificant. Now, the 3x is outside the radical. So if you multiply 3x by the square root of 1 over x squared, is the same as 3x times 1 over x, where the x's will cancel, and you're just going to get 3. Okay, so now this expression looks much better. So the only term that's like bottom heavy is the 1 over x. That's going to turn into 0 as we apply the limit. So it's going to be 1 divided by the square root of 9 plus 0 plus 3. And the square root of 9 is 3, and 3 plus 3 is 6. So it's 1 over 6, which is 0.1667, or 0.16 repeated. Now, what is the limit as x approaches positive infinity? And the function is e to the x. What's the answer for this one? Well, if we substitute infinity into the equation, we get e raised to the infinity. Now, let's say if you plug in 1,000 into the equation, e to the 1,000 power is a very large number. So this is going to approach positive infinity. Now, what about the limit as x approaches negative infinity? So let's use substitution. What's e to the negative infinity? This is the same as 1 over e to the positive infinity. Whenever you have a negative exponent, if you move the e from the top to the bottom, the negative sign is going to change and become positive. Now, we said that e to the infinity is infinity. So we have 1 over infinity. 1 divided by a large number is a small number. So the answer is 0. Now, we can prove it based on the graph of e to the x. The horizontal asymptote is the x-axis, and the function increases at an increasing rate. So, as x approaches positive infinity, so if you follow the curve, as you go to the right, notice that it goes up to positive infinity. So that's why we could say the limit as x approaches infinity for the e to the x function is infinity. Now, what about the left end behavior as x approaches negative infinity? What's going to happen? So if we follow the curve all the way to the left side, notice that it approaches the x-axis, where y is equal to 0. So the left end behavior is 0, but the right end behavior is infinity. What is the limit as x approaches positive infinity for the inverse tangent function? What do you think the answer is? Well, let's find out what the inverse tangent of a large number is equal to. The inverse tangent of 1,000, let's make sure the calculator is in radian mode. So inverse tan, actually, let's keep it in degree mode. Inverse tan of 1,000 is about 89.94 degrees. Now, what about inverse tangent of, let's say, a million? Or 1 times 10 to the 6. This is going to be 89.9999 degrees. So, therefore, the inverse tangent as x approaches infinity, it's going to be about 90 degrees, or pi over 2. Now, it makes sense, though, because tangent pi over 2 is undefined. But the limit, as x approaches pi over 2 from the left side, for the tangent function, is positive infinity. The reason why I chose the left side is because if you plug in inverse tangent of 1,000, we got 89.9, which is less than 90, or to the left of 90. 
since these two are, since tangent and inverse tangent are inverses of each other, we need to switch the x and the y values. Now, what about the limit as x approaches negative infinity for the inverse tangent function? So what happens if we plug in a very large negative number? So what's the inverse tangent of negative 1,000? This is going to be negative 89.9. So therefore, it approaches negative pi over 2. Now, if you graph the inverse tangent function, it looks something like this. There's a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. The tangent function has a vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, but the inverse tangent function has a horizontal asymptote at those two points. It pretty much changes, so to speak. Now the graph looks something like this. So notice that as x approaches negative infinity, or basically the left end behavior, if we follow the curve to the left, it approaches negative pi over 2. Now, as x approaches positive infinity, so if we go all the way to the right, notice that it follows the other horizontal asymptote, which is pi over 2. So you can always find the answer if you know the shape of the graph. Now, let's say if you have a function, f of x is equal to 3 over x plus 2. And if you're asked to find the points of discontinuity, how would you do it? If you have a fraction, set the bottom equal to 0. So this is the vertical asymptote. So therefore, x cannot equal negative 2. The graph for this function looks like this. There's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, since this function is bottom heavy, and there's a vertical asymptote at negative 2. And it looks like this. So if you can't cancel the x plus 2 expression, it's a vertical asymptote, and so you have an infinite discontinuity, which is a non-removable discontinuity. Now what about this function? Let's say if f of x is equal to 2 times x minus 1 divided by x, x minus 1, and x plus 2. What are all the points of discontinuity? So if you set each factor equal to 0, the first point of discontinuity is x cannot equal 0, x cannot equal 1, and x cannot equal negative 2. Now, how would you classify each point of discontinuity? So notice that we can cancel the x minus 1. So this is a whole, or which is a point discontinuity. The whole is also known as a removable discontinuity. The other two factors that do not cancel are the vertical asymptotes. And they may look something like this. They can go in opposite directions or in the same direction. But it's an infinite discontinuity. So since we couldn't cancel x and x plus 2, it's associated with a vertical asymptote. So that's a non-removable discontinuity. Now, what if you have an absolute value function? Let's say the absolute value of x plus 2 over x plus 2. Now, notice that we can cancel the x plus 2. So it's not a vertical asymptote. However, it's not exactly a whole. The absolute value function can be broken into two parts, x plus 2 and negative x plus 2. So it's x plus 2 when x is less than negative 2. If you plug in negative 2, that's when it's 0, and that's where it changes direction. For the other one, I take it back. This has to be greater than negative 2. And for this one, it's less than negative 2. So if you take the limit as x approaches 
negative 2 from the left side, we need to use the negative version of the absolute value function. So it's going to be negative x plus 2 divided by x plus 2, which is going to be negative 1. And if you take the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right side, we need to use the positive version of the absolute value function. So it's going to be just x plus 2 divided by x plus 2, which will give you positive 1. Either case, the point of discontinuity is when the bottom is equal to 0. If you set x plus 2 equal to 0, you'll see that x cannot be negative 2. That's where the point of discontinuity is. So when you graph the function, it's going to look something like this. To the left of negative 2, actually it's going to be negative 1. And to the right of negative 2, it's going to be positive 1. At negative 2, that's where it changes direction. But notice that we have a jump discontinuity. So whenever you have an absolute value over that same function, it's a jump discontinuity, which is also known as a non-removable discontinuity. For those of you who are wondering why we can split the absolute value function into two parts, positive x and negative x, here's why. Consider the graph of the absolute value of x. It's a v-shape. Now, this portion of the graph is equal to x. This portion of the graph, it has a negative slope, it's decreasing. This is why it is equal to negative x. So as you can see, when x is less than 0, it's equal to positive x. When it's greater than 0, it's negative x. Now this function is defined at 0. So sometimes you might have a less than or equal to symbol. But I'll leave it to you to put it there. Just know that when you have an absolute value function, you could break it into x or negative x. So if you have, let's say, the absolute value of x plus 4, you can separate it into x plus 4 and negative x plus 4. So it's going to change direction at negative 4. That's where the inside part is equal to 0. So it's going to be the positive version when x is greater than negative 4. But when it's less than negative 4, use the uh, negative part of the function. 